Hi, Dr. Lin. Hi, how are you? Thank you. I, I'm good, uh, and I hope you are too. Uh, yes. Well, <laughs> welcome to our conference. Um, can you tell us what kind of doctor you are and where you practice and what you do there? Sure. I'm, I'm a urologic surgeon, and I'm in Seattle, Washington, well across the nation from you. And um, I have kind of a mixed practice, so I have a, a, a clinical side with uh, surgery and so forth and seeing patients. And then I have a, a, a research program at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, which is in, in Seattle as well. And so I have a, a kind of a dual appointment and, and do both research as well as clinical care patients with mostly prostate cancer patients. And you see these patients once or twice a week, or you have a thriving practice, so to speak? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have my clinical time is about three to three and a half days a week. And then I spend a day, day and a half doing research and, of course, lectures and writing and grants and things like we're doing today. Yeah. Uh, uh, if we had an eight day week, we, we'd have <laughs> a, a few hours of rest. So, <laughs> exactly. Right. So w one of the reasons we're talking is because uh, I've taken note and uh, one of our mutual friends who's at uh, Sutherland also taken note of your work with the Canary Foundation and the mm -hmm. past study. Yeah. Male care has uh, been advocating for guys with adva doing advanced stage prostate cancer, um, active surveillance prostate cancer mm -hmm. for uh, over two decades. And, yeah. you know, we see ourselves as one of the initiators or pioneers of the active surveillance space uh, starting in the year 2000 or so. I mean, it's hard to yeah. nail it down, but principally around the psychosocial aspect of it. and. Oh, yeah we've noticed that patients experience a disconnect, you know, doctors feel like the doctors, the patient, the men in our support groups report back, doctors see themselves as being like the kings of active surveillance. Patients see the social workers and psychologists of male care and probably at our counterparts as the kings of active surveillance. So we want to, so today you and I should sort of like combine our kingdoms together and, you know, yeah. with the goal of just getting guys uh, going well on active surveillance and helping them to live longer and enjoy their lives. Um, yeah. Why don't we just spend a minute or two, what do you see as like an appropriate presentation for uh, active surveillance? A guy that you're gonna say, you know what, um, I don't wanna touch the inside of your body. I think you could be better off under sure. this kind of surveillance thing. Yeah, sure. Well, first to give the perspective that um, about active surveillance in general, and I do think we've come a long way. Obviously, you were an early adopter, but I'd say it's more like probably been the last 15-ish years. Um, like the Canary thing, which you mentioned, the Canary Pass study started in 2007, and that was a couple years after active surveillance started going. But I would say we've changed a little bit. Before, before I answer your question, if you'll, I'll take the liberty of saying that active surveillance has come this long way. Originally, it was simply just to assure men that they did not have evil cancer that was destined to kill them. And it was the big C word. And oh my gosh, we have to get your cancer taken care of and do radiation or do surgery. And I think there was, there was probably at least 10 years to say, we're over treating these guys. We need to, oh, we need to avoid, avoid the over treatment. And it took us probably 10 years to get to that point. And now finally on the guidelines, it says, and we'll get into this in a minute, what the typical patient would be for active surveillance. And it actually says active surveillance, surgery and radiation and active surveillance has this little word next to it says preferred. Finally, it says preferred, meaning that's the right, that's the way we want it to go. So it took us a long time to get to the point where we say, okay, now we're gonna avoid, avoid that over treatment. I would say active surveillance is entering a new phase now for the last, maybe five or more years to where now we're turning our attention to finding the bad actors within that. Cause there are a couple of worse actors, let's just say, let's put it that way. We'll get into that later in this conversation probably, but getting to your question again, what have we done for the first stage is just finding the ideal candidate. And that ideal candidate is somebody that typically has lower volume, low grade, typically Gleason grade group one or three plus three equals six disease low PSA, meaning preferably less than 10. And those, that's like kind of like the initial characteristics. I say there are nuances behind that, like how healthy a patient is and so forth and how long the typical life expectancy might be and so forth. I, I do think that patients as they age, um, 
And again, there's competing risks of having something happen to them from, from another disease or something like that. And so prostate cancer kind of goes down on their list. And especially if they have low grade, low volume, you know, low PSA. Those are the, those are the great ones. Does they, how did, so within your practice, guidelines aside, although guidelines mm -hmm. you know, on the table in front of you, mm -hmm. the, how does race and age play into this? Uh, yeah, great questions. There's a bit of controversy. In fact, like this week, okay, um, uh, November 3rd, so two days ago, there was an article that came out in JAMA. Right. Um, and, it, and, it, and I'm sure you've seen this. It looked at a race in, in, in a VA population. There are some issues with it. I would point everybody to look at the editorial first and then read the paper um, and saying that maybe perhaps there are worse outcomes. And then my group put out a paper that said that there are equal outcomes. And so there's a little bit of a dichotomy. Here's what I know. I know that and unfortunately, uh, African-American race, they have, they do ha seem to have worse cancers. They do seem to have more progression they have. And so, but on active surveillance, the question, I think it's still a question. I, I don't think that necessarily race alone is a trigger to say we need to do treatment rather than surveillance. Age, amazingly, is the same thing. In fact, in our group, the Canary Group, but as well as Hopkins and Toronto and UCSF and others, the older the man, actually, the with the higher the chance that they will find a little worse cancer on surveillance. It kind of sounds counterintuitive, but it is true. I will say this: when I see a younger man, and um, I saw a 48-year-old earlier this week, I've seen men in their 30s, but men in their 50s is considered younger in 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 uh, prostate cancer. And I will sometimes tell them, it's not a matter of if you're going to eventually get treated. I mean, you're a great active surveillance candidate now, but it's not a matter of if you'll ever get treated. It's kind of a matter of when, because you're only 50 and maybe 30, 40 year life expectancy, you might, there's a good chance you'll be treated before 70. As opposed to if I see a 70 year old, then they're, they're, it is a matter of if they'll ever need to get treatment. So I think younger men kind of eventually are going to get treated if you look at the data, um, but that doesn't mean they need to get treated when they're young, so. Yeah. So it's sort it's sort I mean for younger and middle aged guys it's sort of like I mean not to it's sort of like an apology from our the medical side to say sorry I knocked on your door too soon you know let's talk I mean good that I know where you live you know and do open my envelope every year but yeah. uh, you know I'll see you probably in ten or fifteen years for something more interesting well, that's a, to do that that is a great way of thinking about it. I never really. Um, thought about it in that way, but I, I think that's probably true. We have to figure out, though, I think a better way of predicting who that person is. I mean, I've had patients on active surveillance for 15 years, so, um, but I've also had people on active surveillance for 15 months. You know, and then 15 months later, we find a little bit worse cancer. Maybe they should have just gotten treated sooner. I, again, so there's that. There's now our switch in attention from, as I said, all these years it was trying to convince everybody that's not a big deal, cancer, and it's not and to make it the preferred first step. But now we switched our attention to finding those that probably shouldn't be on active surveillance, number one. And then we should try to find those who could be on inactive surveillance. In other words, you know, we do biopsies every couple of years or every year in some cases that don't need any biopsies for five years or six years or seven years because there's almost no chance they're going to have something worse that we find. Why go through all those biopsies? They're, painful, they have uh, infection risk, bleeding risk, you know, psychosocial risks, like you said, there's worry and anxiety um, concerns. And so we should be able to find that group of patients that doesn't need to have surveillance very intensively. Yeah. That's, that's the next goal. Yeah. And, and just to close out this section, so to speak, yeah. I mean, would you ever offer, I mean, would you sort of discourage guys with a Gleason 4-3 and more than one core, even as, as eager as they may be to, you know, be active surveillance, you know. In general, I would if they're otherwise healthy and are going to have a 10, 15 year life expectancy. Yes, yeah. I, and with a 4-3. With a 3-4, there is even some debate in some circles about 3-4 disease. I mean, the ideal candidate is 3 plus 3, but you know, your listeners and your followers know these, all these little nuances. And so with three, four, it, it, there is still a debate out there about whether we should be surveying. I think that there are some that is on the guidelines now as an option. It's not preferred. 
And I do think that we probably over treat some of those three fours. We probably do. But I think it's just because uh, we as a, as a physician team are, are risk averse of don't want to miss that window of curability. Yeah. And there are other considerations too that I'm for legal things and stuff like that, I imagine. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a little, that's, I think that drives some of it. Sure. Let's be transparent. <laughs> I have no yeah, problems yeah. With, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, for our patients to understand that we're speaking the truth, we have to lay out the truth. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there a way to make, let me see. Ah, oh, it's my volume. Okay. We're good. So let's now talk about guys who have chosen active surveillance. They've done informed decision-making, you know, basically it's, probably 99 out of 100 guys who are watching this are already engaged in active surveillance. What's life like now? Yeah, I think that in terms of uh, on the sort of easy logistics side of, of visits, it's, it's routine visits and checks. On the lifestyle side, there's a whole field of whether diet and exercise and so forth really have an effect and they can take those in two parts. Is, is that okay? Sure. Let's do it. Yeah. So, so I, the, there is, there is also a, a bit of controversy as far as how often we should see patients, how often we should do PSA measurements, how often we should do biopsies, all places do it differently. I have a slide in the talk that shows all the major centers do their, their assessments differently. I think the bottom line is that, and there's no golden rule. Uh, uh, for there's no gold standard, let's say, for how often to see a man who's on active surveillance. I would say that an earlier assessment of uh, with a biopsy is is reasonable, and then start spacing them out after the first couple. So we in our group do a biopsy at about year one, a biopsy about year two, and if all those biopsies look good, then we start spacing out every couple of years. Okay. There's this issue about whether we should do an MRI, and Again, I think there's a lot of controversy there. We, we just published a paper that showed that the MRI finds as many as it misses, um, uh, because if you just do regular biopsies, you, you find a unique cancer. So I think that the answer of the MRI is a little out, out there. I, I tend to do an MRI on certain patients that have a little higher volume cancer maybe. Okay. And so, MRI, you mean a multi-parametric, a bi-parametric? What, what are you talking yeah, great, about? Great question. So right now in this country, it's multi-parametric. I say this country um, because there is uh, the, the, the charge coding, as, as you probably know, uh, you know, what's driving this is somewhat billing. The biparametric really has not been embraced yet. And I think that there's a little bit of thing on the radiology side there to figure that out. But it is true, multi-parametric, you get all these phases and there are really only two that are important. Can we just do those two and have a equally good image? Or, I think so. I mean, the, the issue, I, and I, we were talking about this the other day, the, an MRI in Europe costs about 250 euro. Mm -hmm. You know, an MRI in Canada, somewhere around 500 to 700, depending uh, dollars, US dollars. And we all know how much an MRI is here, okay, in the United States. So there's great disparity. And so obtaining MRIs, as far as the impact on the healthcare system across the globe is, is immensely variable. Here in this country, again, if we got MRIs and every man that has active surveillance, we'd bankrupt our system. I mean, we really would. Um, and I just don't think that's reasonable for a man that has one little piece of Gleason 6 disease and one core of the PSA of five uh, it, and has had a few biopsies. I don't think they need an MRI. And no one's proven that they should, all right? Yeah. And fact, then there's the impact of contrast as well, uh, which is still a, a soft, controversial, but really sort of a common sense, like why do it if you don't need it kind of thing. I completely agree. And so again, there, so there are these issues. There was a randomized clinical trial where they did flip a coin on men on extra surveillance and heads, they got an MRI and tails, they didn't, and they really didn't show any difference. And, um, and, and th they did do a little follow-up showing there might be some later, but at the, at the point in time, they didn't sign any difference. We'd like to do that trial again and do a little bit bigger trial and hopefully answer that, that question. But right now it's a little controversial. So as far as assessments go, yeah, it's regular visits. I usually see people twice a year and get PSAs and talk to them and do an exam and then do biopsies, like I said, a couple early and then start spacing them out and then do an MRI, particularly maybe in the three plus four men 
or the men with higher volume gleason uh, grade group six disease. And the last thing is this whole idea of biomarkers, you know, Perlaris, Oncotype, Decipher, um, those haven't really been proven to be of benefit in, in most studies in actual surveillance, although there are a few that do show, maybe it has some hint of benefit. Yeah, and but do you find any utility to uh, free PSA measurements at this point? So we looked at that as well, and free PSA is part of the 4K score as well as the PHI, and the Price to Health Index. And so that data is still coming out. I can't say for sure. I, my hunch is that it probably won't have a big indication, right? Yeah. We have looked at PSA kinetics, you know, rate of PSA rise, and that did look like it does predict uh, worse outcomes. Yeah. And do you have a favorite nomogram that you use, at, at, you know, or suggest the patients use? For active surveillance, yeah. um, there really aren't very many. Mm -hmm. We have a canary nomogram. I mean, if you just look up, uh, canaryprostate.org and you, you've, it's our, it's our calculator that's right there online ready for use. And if you plug in your, the characteristics and one thing that we haven't mentioned yet today that is very predictive, not only in the Canary series, but at UCSF at Hopkins, it's been widely reported is PSA density. It's just simply or volume of the prostate. Okay. And so that we do have a calculator that you plug in PSA number of biopsies, number of cores, volume of your prostate or PSA density, um, time since your diagnosis, and it'll spit out your chance of having worse cancer on your next biopsy. Um, so it's it's a very functional uh, calculator. Yeah, but, but you know, PSA densis, uh, prostate density, uh, yeah. you know, friends of mine in Europe who are urologists and one is a radiation oncologist, I mean, they, I mean I don't, I've never really asked them deeply, like, what do you think of it? But they do use it. I mean, is there a sense that it's used more frequently and more powerfully uh, in Europe than it is in the States? Uh, good question. I don't know. Um, maybe. I mean, it is, PSA density is on the NCCN guidelines to differentiate low risk versus very low risk. So I think more and more people are calculating it. There mm -hmm. are some ultrasound machines that I've seen people use that they put in the PSA and when they measure the volume during the biopsy, it calculates it for them. So mm -hmm. I'm starting to see that on some biopsy reports. Um, I use it obviously because I think that volume of the prostate is a measure of, uh, it can be a surrogate measure for aggressiveness of that person's uh, uh, prostate cancer. Very good. And before we leave this sort of section of, you know, scanning and testing and such, a yeah. couple of things around the biopsy. So sure. as you were saying, multiple biopsies, I, I mean, like, or you're saying a biopsy every year or two, and then, yeah. you know, every three years or so. I mean, I could hear a thousand virtual guys behind me scratching and pulling my jacket off saying, mm. no, you know, like, I mean, Talk about risk, talk about utility, you know, talk about what happens for guys who just refuse it. Are they having similar outcomes? Yeah, great. Okay, great, great question. So um, first, um, I'll, go, I'll start from the second question first about compliance, because there is this element of uh, if if you recommend a biopsy, they don't have one, do they do worse? And so they're for the first time ever, I think it was published in a journal of neurology, and the first author was, I think, Detsky, but um, it was Lori Klotz's group from Canada that did show that that patients that had worse compliance, or in other words, skipping biopsies, skipping appointments, loss to follow-up, did have worse outcomes. And, and they were real outcomes. They were like metastasis and maybe even, and there were a few deaths. So the, I think compliance to the protocol and making sure that they get followed is important. With regards to the biopsy itself, I agree. Uh, yeah, I know, and I said it earlier on, if we can identify a group of men that don't need biopsies so often, don't need those first five years of biopsies or something like that, that would save them three or four biopsy sessions. I think that would go a, a long way. I do think imaging might eventually help us. Uh, it has not there yet. But the way I look at it is if we take a theoretical group of 100 men, and if we could find maybe the lower quartile, 20, 25 of them that really can be on inactive surveillance. I don't have to see them so frequently or just monitor PSAs. Don't get those painful biopsies. And that's great. And, and I can find 25 of them maybe on the other end that say, you know, you're not the greatest candidate for active surveillance. You should just have surgery or radiation because you're destined to be bad somehow. And then the middle guys are unfortunately going to have to do what we've been doing for the last, as you know, 15, 20 years which is fairly regular assessments. I think that'd be a pretty good home run and we're trying to work that way. 
and we do have some models out now that we can tell, tell a patient with reasonable certainty if they have certain characteristics. You know, PSA, prostate volume, PSA density, PSA kinetics, age, race, family history, BMI, it's all in a calculator together and it spits out that they might fall in that lower risk group that they can avoid biopsies. And, and I know your, 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 your followers would appreciate that. They don't have to do those biopsies because they are painful. The last thing to answer your last question is risks. There's about a one to 2% risk of bleeding, significant bleeding, um, doc, like get, come in the hospital bleeding. And there's about, depending on where you look, probably an equal one to 2% chance of having a hospitalization or significant infection. There are a lot of minor infections though. And um, again, we're placing a needle through the rectum. You know, it's not, it's not unexpected that we're gonna get these. Although now more and more, not only in Europe, but also here in the States, we're doing these transperineally, as you know, right through the skin. And the infection risk is less than at less than one tenth of one percent, so it's zero point one percent. It work? I mean, I don't know the history of biopsies, but I'm get. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't sort of the realm of biopsy start as transperineum and then sort of went to rectal, and now it's you know the infection. Yeah, they went. Renal, you know, yeah, they've they've gone a long way from. They used to be like literally finger guided. Place yeah, yeah. in there, yeah. finger guided. Place a needle in there that wasn't like a a, a click, like a spring loaded thing. It was this uh, uh, Vin Silver needle. It was it was a different way of doing it. I mean, I started in early '90s, so over twenty you know twenty years ago, over twenty years ago, and we were had the biopsy gun already, and so I didn't ever have to do that kind of a biopsy. But yeah, you're right. It was like finger guided down there, you know, just poking around, and now we have ultrasound. And uh, we have a needle that is a spring loaded. It's much more comfortable and much, much more uh, better sampling. Right, but I was actually wondering the transperineal for oh. version. I mean, wasn't that the one of the original ways to do it? It was, it was. And now we're returning yeah. to it. We're returning to it in large part because of antibiotic resistant organisms. I think that's a lot of it. It, it really is, it's driving it is that the antibiotic resistant organisms are getting so prevalent that we need to reduce going through the rectum. And there are many different types of strategies like uh, doing enemas with betadine or something to cleanse the rectum, or the biggest one is doing a swab of the rectum to make sure that the patient, before the, before, well before the biopsy, like the week before, to make sure the patient does not have any uh, resistant organisms. So biopsy, um, not, always palatable, but something essential for longevity and good quality care. And also as a way to sort of figure out when to pull the trigger and go for a next level therapy. Um, yes. Geez, I just forgot an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> the idea of, let's see if I can pull it out. Uh, no, I'm not going to be able to pull it out a little bit later. The idea of, oh, of course, uh, second opinions on on pathology, on, on you know, so at mail care, we're also like early on and, you know, like uh, everyone should, and the state, uh, I think around 2004 we, in our New York City group, 50-year-old uh, guy presents with a Gleason 6, uh, you know, as urologist saying you're young, you're gonna live, you know, let's do surgery, you might have been at Sloan or something. Uh, Post-surgical pathology, nothing, not even pins. Oh. Uh, yeah, and he's, you know, suffering and, you know, and, and in those days, erectile functioning was really impacted and, sure. you know, a youngish guy. Um, from that moment on, we tried to figure out what we as a support group organization could do. And we came up with a simple thing at minimal, have a second pathologist at some other facility throw eyes on your slides, on all of your slides, not just the, neg uh, the, the positive ones, but negative as well. What do you think of that? I, I think it's a great kind of rule of thumb. I, I do, I mean, obviously I'm in a academic center that the pathologists we have here only do prostate, almost nearly only do prostate. And so, and they sign out as a group, so they'll always look, have their partner look at it. So you're kind of getting an internal second opinion. Although for other cases uh, I do, and anyone that comes here from, from an outside institution, we also all also re review their slides. So they're getting two opinions if they're diagnosed at an outside place. 
we're all for that. In fact, many of our patients will want a third opinion and um, they'll send it, you know, the most common places with Dr. Epstein at Hopkins, of course, you, you know, you know him. And I think that that's, we, we highly encourage that. I will say this for active surveillance, the topic of today, a lot of the cancers are tiny cancers. They're one millimeter a piece, uh, one millimeter along, along a core. And so oftentimes those are, are, are discrepant reads. Now, we do have central pathology within our, our group. Uh, you know, I have 10 sites across North America and they, they got together about five years ago and they had a hundred, the pathologists, they got a hundred consecutive cases and they're all GU pathologists, specialists across academic sites, Stanford, UCSF, Hopkins and everything. And they looked at the uh, needles and they didn't all agree all the time. And so even within specialty pathologists, they don't always agree and the, it wasn't, and it was only on the little ones. I mean, if it had clear cancer, they kind of agreed. But if it was this little tiny little focus, they could not agree with what the grade was. Some would call it a 4-3. Some would call it a 3-3. And so I, I think that they're, and my dad's a pathologist, so I make fun of pathologists all the time. <laughs> and, but they, but they, they, they know, they know that it's almost like radiologists. Two radiologists look at an MRI, a multiparametric, multiparametric MRI, and there'll definitely be different reads on that. With pathology, it is a morphometric read. I'll end with saying that my thinking is, Daryl, that we will conquer that with co some computer-aided approaches. I wouldn't say artificial yeah. intelligence, but maybe artificial intelligence, but we'll, we'll fix some of these interpretive issues, I hope. Yeah, Phillips, um, I did a thing with yes. Phillips uh, three yes. years ago now. Uh, yeah, I mean, man, th th how exciting is that? Three-dimensional pathology. Yes. You know, it's extraordinary. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So uh, there, there, are near future opportunities for improvements on understanding what's going on inside of us. Okay. But for today, for late 2020, going into 2021, and through 2021, how does the guy who's doing active surveillance know when to what are know when to do next level treatment? Yeah. You know, this is like the, the issue is what's the trigger? You know, what's the trigger for uh, stopping active surveillance? I mean, the most, I tell you, from looking at all the data and from seeing hundreds of patients with, with this, the most common trigger is finding higher grade disease on a biopsy. That, that is usually the most common trigger. In fact, it's at least two thirds of the men that are getting treated after starting active surveillance. They tr get treated sometime. Most of those men are because we find slightly higher grade cancer or really higher grade cancer in their biopsies. There are some men that the PSA is just slowly creeping up and it's just, they're getting uncomfortable. It gets to double digits and they're saying, I don't care what my PS or my biopsies show, it's getting too high and I'm now kind of intermediate risk instead of low risk, I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna have treatment. And I think that that's the next most common reason or that they're just having more biopsies out of the 12 or 14 or however many people take that are increasing. Th those are the most common triggers, however, about 25% or so of patients are getting treated uh, after starting active surveillance um, with no, no difference in their biopsies, no difference in their PSAs, they're just getting treated. We think that's because of, of anxiety, if you will, or con, you know, extreme concern or worry. Um, and in fact, we're gonna study that. In our group, we have quality of life scores for all these patients over the last years, and we're trying to figure, and we have this anxiety score, it's called a memorial anxiety score. And we're looking at those, the data have just come out last week and they look kind of interesting. And in other words, men and their, and we're also looking at of course caregivers and so forth. So men and their families who have more anxiety and more concern or more quality of life issues um, are getting treated even when their biopsies look the exact same. Yeah. You know, please and six, please and six, please and six, PSA the same, they're getting treated. And it looks like it's because of anxiety and concern and quality of life issues. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I mean, so we got about 76,000 guys in our online communities across yeah. three platforms right now. And we sort of parse them out to where their highest level of interest is. In our anxiety support group, there are over 46,000 guys, you know, compared to about 11,300 or so advanced stage wow. and about 20,000 newly diagnosed. 46,000 in anxiety, which you know, substantially active surveillance guys, you know, and then, then, you know, so 
I mean, the impact of anxiety, and you know, anxiety is a global term. I mean, you know, for many, it's just I can't get to sleep. For many, like I'm, you know, hallucinating, you know, or dream, you know, seeing things out of the corner. You know, I mean, it's a corner of their eyes. Uh, and for some, it's about relationships with spouses and partners or coworkers, or just like, you know bothering them. So they're actually experiencing stress, but they we don't have stress groups, they navigate into the anxiety group. Yeah. It's it's like, you know, the emotion, people talk about how like, why not, you know, have massive screenings for PSA? And what's the problem with a little information? Well, there's a big problem, you know, I, I mean, from my experience, uh, uh, running a, you know, this network of people and for our understanding in depth, there's harm from information for many guys. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's your skill set, you know, your genuinely brilliant skill set. And, you know, you know, your colleagues that's able to sort of both calm, parse out who really needs and sort of help guys navigate as long as they can within the AS realm, you know, space until they, you know, and if they just, you know, I mean, some days it's, Sometimes, you know, whether they need, an, you know, a surgery or radiation treatment, uh, you know, it's better than going nuts and not enjoying yeah. their lives, you know. Oh, I think your comments are completely germane to this audience and, and to the to the actors in the space. I mean, we we um, there is a group there is a group that has been casually convening um, and and pondering the question about whether we should call three plus three prostate cancer something different. And I know you've heard about this before because no one ever died of three plus three prostate cancer ever. And it's just the missing of the three plus four, the four plus three or something like that, right? So um, even renaming three plus three to be something that doesn't include the word cancer in it because it would go a long way to comforting individuals who are diagnosed with three plus three uh, prostate cancer, I guess. They're diagnosed with this entity and this entity is not evil. It is not, and I try to, uh, I mean, personally, in my practice, try to comfort them and say, this is not some evil, life-threatening, lethal disease that needs treatment right away like you might've heard from somebody else. No, take a breath, let's think about it. Let's take, take, have a rational decision. You want, if you still want surgery, let's do it two months, three months after the holidays, whatever. Like my January right now is pretty full because a lot of men are saying, you know, I wanna wait until January to have, I mean, can I wait till after the holiday, December holidays? Yes, for sure. You have like a little three plus four disease that's not aggressive, okay? And you might wanna not do anything. Well, no, I want something done. And you know, it's 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 appeasing them. And I, and I think that, and I applaud your efforts within the psychosocial domain, uh, particularly in the surveillance setting. Well, I throw that back to you. I applaud the, uh, the um, evolution of conversation that urologists such as like yourself, you know, ha you know, half with patients compare that to what the conversation was 15 years ago. Oh, you know? I know. I know. We took a lot of prostates out that they needed to. We, we, we unfortunately had a lot of I know I, I supported the the little blue pill business for a long time, <laughs> and we did we did inappropriately. We did we yeah. recognize, we recognize that yeah yeah, and which returns to the idea of this active surveillance is urology's apology to the prostate cancer community. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, but it's also importantly real real quick just to swing in screening a little bit. Yeah. It does it does. I think appease the US PSTF and others that are PSA naysayers and saying, if we show that let's screen, but only treat appropriately, but still screen because we wanna find the bad actors. You know, these little turtles on the block will find, but not treat, but the birds and the, and the, and the rabbits and things, the bad actors we need to find, we need to still screen. And I think that the uptake of actor surveillance I believe played a big role in the change of the grading for PSA screening uh, because we're actually doing it and we're showing we're showing the primary care physicians and others that no, we're not treating all prostate cancers, the apologies, uh, as you said, and we are and we're doing the right thing, which I, I do think made a difference. Yeah. And, you know, for, for our support group end, we mm -hmm. see the USPTF as having given the kick in the ass to the physician community by saying, look, there's harm from doing this massive screening without understanding. Come up with something better. And yeah. you replied, okay, we did. 
It's called that, you know, I mean, we're going to take the watchful waiting thing. We're going to make that a slightly different kind of thing, keep the term. But we're now doing, lo and, you know, lo and behold, active surveillance. Yeah. And of course, it's the smart and appropriate way to do this. It doesn't deal with the, the, the emotional and uh, psychosocial contents of diagnosis, but as dramatically as it should, as it as, I mean, it just can't, you know, I mean, you tell somebody you have cancer, you know, I mean, like, and it doesn't matter whether it's developed world, lesser developed world. I mean, it's one of the few words that in, that conveys, you know, f uh, fear and dread in any language, in any part of the, you, you could go to Sukartu Island in Yemen and say to somebody that I think you might have prostate cancer and they're going to react the same way a guy in New York or Seattle would. Yeah, that's true. You know? I haven't thought about that again. I mean, that's, it's, that's true. It's, uh, it's, it's the big, it's the C word. And then sometimes they, people glaze over and you can tell you got you to talk to them another day, you know? Yeah. So what can, and actually one more like 90 seconds or less kind of thing. Sure. You got guys who are ready or who either they're, they're, they've earned, pulling a, a, a next level therapy, you know, by consequence of the, you know, the advanced can stage of their cancer, the, the, uh, or they're just freaking out and just want to do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think of guys who say to you, okay, I want to do something, or I, I agree with you, I need, you know, the, the numbers on this and that suggest I need to do something or tell me I need to do something, mm -hmm. but I don't want to do surgery or radiation. Why can't I do uh, Casadex, you know, or why can't I do something biochemical to reduce my PSA like these advanced stage cancer guys? I mean, I could deal with diminished testosterone. I don't think I could deal with the impact of genuine nerve damage and erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. I think that uh, I can take it in a couple of ways. Obviously, as you know, the guidelines don't support that. So it's not really an option, although there have been um, a, a few studies that have looked at what they call primary androgen deprivation therapy, so PADT, and the results with primary uh, androgen deprivation therapy are, are, are actually pretty good for a low risk man or a lower risk man in terms of death from prostate cancer, metastasis and so forth. And, and it is quite a bit lower, but as a patient's tumor gets worse, primary ADT for localized prostate cancer does it worse, okay? And so I think it's difficult to imagine doing that in a younger, healthier patient. In a patient who is older and has a fair amount of comorbidities, that surgery will be dangerous, or they have something like, let's say, inflammatory bowel disease or ulcerative colitis or something like that that, that um, uh, make radiation more difficult. We and others have done that because it's the only course that we have. And we do think it does prolong life. We usually do it on an intermittent fashion. So we would block them down for a year. Their PSA will go to zero almost. Of course, they have side effects. And then we stop it for a few years, two, three, four years, and then, then do it again. And we do it in intermittent fashion. And again, those are in patients who are either unfit for surgery or have medical issues that they don't want to do or can't do or refuse radiation. And obviously, I think many of us feel that doing something rather than nothing, if it's a real true trigger that they, they deserve some form of treatment, is better, uh, is better than nothing. So... The next wave, the next frontier, I think, is, is going to be some form of focal therapies. So as imaging gets better, we might biopsy somebody and say, oh, you don't have 3-3 disease. You have, you know, 4 plus 3 or something like that or 3 plus 4, but it's in this little discrete part of your whole prostate. Let's do something to that area. And I think if we get imaging better and then we get better energy delivery, um, that's coming. Um, I don't, I don't know. It won't probably won't be in the next five years, but it, it probably be in the next 10. So, uh, and we're talking about high food now. Uh, well, either high food or cryo, but probably high food type things, or there are these nanoparticles. There's a, there's a company that you infuse something and then you shine a light on it. And it makes oh yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that kind of, those types of companies. Yeah. Yeah. And frankly, when I, mean, that sounded Highly exciting. I mean, like yeah. there was some presentation about uh, liver cancer that was uh, yes. dealt with uh, at ASCO a couple of years ago yes. at one of these big conferences. And uh, 
that was another like, wow, that would be super. And of course, you know, like all things that are glossy, you know, they it rubs off rather quickly. So, are, 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 so are are you suggest within in your opinion, uh, high food it really isn't like uh, 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 um, I don't know. I was going to say state of the art, but that's not a really good phrase. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't recommend. Would you recommend high food to your patients now? I'd recommend it on a study. So if, if there's a clinical study of it, I think that's the most preferred for me in my situation and in my position, we've been recommending it on a study and we ourselves are involved, but um, it's again, in this country so far, it's not on our guidelines at all. And, in, and until it's on our guidelines at a cancer center, like where I work at University of Washington, then we, we, ha we can't really do it unless it's on the study, it's not considered a standard of care treatment. And so, but is it being done? Yes. Does it work? Yes, it probably does. Heating and freezing the prostate? Yes, it probably kills cancer cells. Is there a long enough term follow-up? Not that I've seen. Uh, Europe has a couple of very major studies, longer studies. Um, and I think we'll get there. I'm, I'm hoping we'll get there. I, I really am. Uh, but, it, but it'll take more studies and longer yeah. follow-up. You know, uh, and I do want to sort of like both just cover my ass, so to speak, cover mail care's ass in the sense that when we're talking about, when I suggested the idea of uh, guys going, uh, skipping uh, surgery, radiation opportunity, jump into next level, you know, it's not so much that, I mean, we're certainly not recommending that. And, and we're on the same page as you described as an organization, me as a clinician, you know, I mean, we're in agreement on this. But the, pro the, the thing with active surveillance guys, the, you know, the, the process of a couple of years of active surveillance in a way trains a guy to look for the least invasive opportunity and almost makes that the holy grail as opposed to something possibly curative or not. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I that, do. Yeah. I think people, I think men self-select a little bit there's a little bit of self-selection there if they're willing to go on extra surveillance at the front end because there still are a proportion of men that have cancer that we think should be just surveyed and they just they choose not to so men that choose at the front end to say i want surveillance are going to be more likely than men to choose something more minimal rather than radical and i and i do say it's called radical prostatectomy for a reason and radiation therapy, they don't call it radical radiation therapy, but it is, okay? So but both of those treatments are radical therapies. And I always say, I tell my patients, you're on this path, and the first fork in the road is do nothing for a while, surveillance, or radical therapy. And radical therapy, then you have another fork in the road, either surgery or radiation, and they're both radical therapies. They both have side effects, nothing is for free. And so I do hope there'll be a third path eventually after taking the surveillance maybe path of something more minimally invasive, less radical. At this point, we don't have that as standard of care. In the time we have remaining, um, let's talk about what guys can do on their own. And not just like the general, th I mean, you know, get real, I mean, if, if, if I could sort of push you to be super specific and super like uh, from your experience, what really works, what, you know, may sound good, but Mm -hmm. Really, you know, it may be good for diabetes or hypertension, but not around prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I mean, what do you, what do you tell so me? So as far as like any example, like health? health uh, yeah, I mean, like uh, eat a walnut every day yeah, or run right. around your block or whatever. Right. I think that, so we and others, as you know, have done a fair number of experiments on diet and exercise mostly. Um and then there was there, so the domains are things like there's diet, there's exercise, there's stress reduction, there's in, in that dom stress reduction domain, there's lots of things, meditation and so forth. And people have looked at um, all different aspects of those. There it was this study with that doing the Dean Ornish diet and, and, and stress reduction and showing maybe PSA levels didn't rise as much. And in general, after the constellation of all those studies, and I did these studies of giving men, believe it or not, broccoli sprout extracts, because there was something in broccoli sprouts that actually looked like it was very uh, advantageous for cancer in general. Um, we fed men low glycemic load diets before surgery, and I looked at their gene expressions for DNA and cell cycle and proliferation. Um, we have a study ongoing right now on men on active surveillance. They have to have a BMI over 25, so they have to technically be overweight, although you know, that's, that's questionable about BMI uh, really being a good measure of that. But 
And then what they do is that they do uh, established um, ADA diet type thing for, for weight loss, as well as structured and supervised exercise three times a day in our exercise lab. At the end of the six month period, we do all these blood measures and so forth, and that study is still ongoing. I do think, and there's been multiple studies looking at exercise and physical activity. And so we measure physical activity on all of our active surveillance patients just to see whether it helps or not that we don't know of those data. At the end of the day, the constellation of all that is heart healthy diet and exercise 30 minutes, four to five times per week, aerobic, and you've heard this before. I do think a heart healthy diet has obviously other health benefits, um, but also it might be, and in all the studies for breast cancer, for all the other cancers, it does show redu reduction in incident breast cancer cases and incident prostate cancer cases. But once a man is diagnosed, we don't know. We really don't. And what's amazing is we looked at whether this is sort of a teachable moment. You know, you just had a cancer diagnosis. Do men change what they do? And we looked at their weight changes in the first year, and as many gained weight as lost it. So and there did not seem to be like that teachable moment, at least in our in our population. Um, so I hope that answers your question. At this point in time, I tell my men, you know, eat a heart healthy diet, try to exercise. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the downsides to support groups that are not well managed is you could have like some evangelist for, you know, broccoli sprouts or something or, you know, pomegranate yeah. juice, or whatever. Yeah. And the guys that don't do that end up feeling, you know, getting more stressed and feeling bad and then they gain weight or lose weight dramatically or whatever, you know, because be, because of a negative consequence of feeling depressed about failure to do what they believe, what they've been told is a good thing to do. Basically, we don't know anything yet. We don't know anything to be a standard recommendation. Yeah. Okay, we, we do have nutritionists, of course, we're a cancer center, we have a lot of that here, but we have nutritionists and so forth that help support us and, and in general. And I and again, I do think that there's that the, the fringe benefits of heart healthy diets and so forth, um, uh, you know, might have some uh, help with cancer, but it definitely has some help with other things in the body. Yeah, I mean, you, we all have our lives, whatever this moment forward, you know, why not feel good physically? Yeah. You know, and if eating just, you know, just doing like heart healthy diets, Mediterranean yes. diets or whatever, yes. you know, I mean, whether it deals with prostate cancer or not, it's just a good thing to do. It is. Know? I will say the one thing that I I tend to as a personal bias a bit um, against sup, some supplements or supplement use. I think that the nutritionists at the Fred Hutch that I work with are are like, well, instead of taking fish oil, you know, eat eat fish, because the fish oil and fish, actual live fish, is different from the fish oil that you buy. Now, the fish oil that you buy might have some good heart benefits, but against cancer, in fact, for prostate cancer, there was a big study that showed that men who took fish oil supplements for a long time actually had worse prostate cancers. And there is some evidence to show that there might be some reason why. Similarly, as you know, the vitamin E and carotene study, the select study showed that maybe yeah. vitamin E and selenium were worse, you know? And so I tell people, you know, eat a the heart healthy balanced diet that have micronutrients all in it, you don't have to take a multivitamin or supplements. Yeah, we tell people, I mean, we got burned by the select thing and that we advocated for it. We thought like, why not? You know, okay, you're not on the trial, just do it. I mean, what's the harm of it? And of course we learned all too well, there's harm to it. Uh, so now we just tell people, you know, everything you put in your mouth changes your life. You, know? <laughs> you are what you eat. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, you're right. So, I mean, you know, you got prostate cancer somehow, it's yeah. unlikely that something you're gonna do now, you know, nutritionally is gonna really alter the course. Unlikely, you know? I yeah. agree, totally. Dr. Lin, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Love thank it. you for the care that you give to your patients and uh, welcome to our conference. My pleasure, you have a great conference. Thanks for having me. Thank you, okay, bye. Bye-bye.